Hello everyone, and welcome to Storytime. I uh, just finished up doing a recording session earlier in the day, so I'm um, not going to be doing any more music tonight, but I thought it might be nice to hang out for a while together and uh, do some more reading. It's been a while since I've done one of these. I think it was back in December when I, uh, when I did the last one of these. So we're going to be picking up again with um, Queen of Sorcery. We already did the, uh, the prologue and chapter one, so we're going to be picking up here with chapter two. Uh, a little bit out of practice, but um, there's only one way to get back into practice, so here we go. Chapter 2 Laldorn of Wildanter was 18 years old, although his ingenuous nature made him seem more boyish. No emotion touched him that didn't instantly re register in his expression, and sincerity shone in his face like a beacon. He was impulsive, extravagant in his declarations, and probably, Garion reluctantly concluded, not overly bright. It was impossible not to like him, however. The following morning, when Garion pulled on his cloak to go out and continue his watch for Hedhar, Laldorin Lel immediately joined him. The young errand had changed out of his garish clothing and now wore brown hose, a green tunic, and a dark brown wool cape. He carried his bow and wore a quiver of arrows at his belt. As they walked through the snow toward the broken west wall, he amused himself by loosing arrows at targets only half visible ahead of him. You're awfully good, Garion said admiringly after one particularly fine shot. I'm an Asturian, Laldorin replied modestly. We've been bowing for thousands of years. My father had the limbs of this bow cut on the day I was born, and I could draw it by the time I was eight. I imagine you hunt a great deal, Garion said, thinking of the dense forest all around them and the tracks of game he'd seen in the snow. It's our most common pastime, Laldorin stopped to pull the arrow he just shot from a tree trunk. My father prides himself on the fact that beef or mutton are never served on his table. I went hunting once, in Sherrick. Deer? Laldorin asked. No, wild boars. We didn't use bows, though. The Sherrick hunt with spears. Spears? How can you get close enough to kill anything with a spear? Garion laughed a bit ruefully, remembering his bruised ribs and aching head. Getting close isn't the problem. It's getting away after you speared him that's the difficult part. Laldorin didn't seem to grasp that. The huntsmen form a line, Garion explained, and they crash through the woods, making as much noise as they can. You take your spear and wait where the boars are likely to pass when they try to get away from the noise. Um, being chased makes them bad-tempered, and when they see you, they charge. That's when you spear them. Isn't that dangerous? Well, Doran's eyes were wide. Garion nodded. I almost got all my ribs broken. He wasn't exactly boasting, but he admitted to himself that he was pleased by Lil Doran's reaction to his story. We don't have many dangerous animals in Asturia, Lildoran said almost wistfully. A few bears, and once in a while a pack of wolves. He seemed to hesitate for a moment, looking closely at Garion. Some men, though, find more interesting to shoot, that, shoot at than wild stags. He said it with a kind of a secretive sidelong glance. Oh? Garion wasn't quite sure what he meant. Hardly a day goes by that some Mimbrate's horse doesn't come home riderless. Garion was shocked at that. Some men think that there are too many membrates in Asturia, Lildoran explained with heavy emphasis. I thought the Arandish Civil War was over. There are many who don't believe that. There are many who believe that the war will continue until Asturia is free from the membrate crown. Lildoran's tone left no question as to where he stood in the matter. Wasn't the country unified after the Battle of Omember? Garion objected. Unified? How could anyone believe that? Asturia is treated like a subject province. The king's court is a bow member. Every governor, every tax collector, every bailiff, every high sheriff in the kingdom is a membrate. There's not a single Asturian in a position of authority anywhere in, Ar in Arandia. The membrates even refuse to recognize our titles. My father, whose line extends back a thousand years, is called landowner. A membrate would sooner bite out his tongue than call him baron. Lodoran's face had gone white with suppressed indignation. I didn't know that, Garion said carefully not sure how to handle the young man's feelings. Asturia's humiliation is almost at an end, however, Lildoran declared fervently. There are some men in Asturia for whom patriotism is not dead, and the time isn't far the time isn't far off when these men will hunt royal game. He emphasized his statement by snapping an arrow at a distant tree. That confirmed the worst of Garion's fears. Lildoran was a bit too familiar with the details not to be involved in this plot. As if he'd realized himself that he'd gone too far, Lildoran stared at Garion with consternation. I'm a fool, he blurted with a guilty look around him. 
I've never learned to control my tongue. Please forget what I just said, Garion. I know you're my friend, and I know you won't betray what I said in a moment of heat. That was the one thing Garion had feared. With that single statement, Leldoran had effectively sealed his lips. He knew that Mr. Wolf should be warned that some wild scheme was afoot, but Leldoran's declaration of friendship and trust had made it impossible for him to speak. He wanted to grind his teeth with, with frustration as he stared full in the face of a major moral dilemma. They walked on, neither one of them speaking, and both a little embarrassed, until they reached the bit of wall where Garion had waited in ambush the day before. For a time, they stared out into the fog, their strained silence growing more uncomfortable by the moment. What's it like in Cinderia? Leldoran asked suddenly. I've never been there. There aren't so many trees, Garion answered, looking over the wall at the dark trunks marching off into the fog. It's, um, an orderly kind of place. Where did you live there? At Faldor's farm. It's near like a rat. Is this Faldor a nobleman? Faldor? Garion laughed. <laughs> no, Faldor's as common as old shoes. He's just a farmer. Decent, honest, good-hearted. I miss him. <laughs> a commoner, then, Lildoran said, seeming ready to dismiss Faldor as a man of no consequence. Rank doesn't really mean very much in Sendaria, Garion told him rather pointedly. What a man does is more important than what he is. He made a wry face. I was a scullery boy. It's not very pleasant, but somebody's got to do it, I suppose. Not a serf, certainly. Lildoran sounded shocked. There aren't any serfs in Sendaria. No serfs? The young Aaron stared at him uncomprehendingly. No, Garion said firmly. We've never found it necessary to have serfs. Lildoran's expression clearly showed that he was baffled by the notion. Garion remembered the voices that had come out to him out of the fog the day before. But he resisted the urge to say something about serfdom. Lildoran would never understand, and the two of them were very close to friendship. Garion felt that he needed a friend just now, and he didn't want to spoil things by saying something that would offend this likable young man. What sort of work does your father do? Lildoran asked politely. He's dead. So is my mother. Garion found that if he said it quickly, it didn't hurt so much. Lildoran's eyes filled with in sudden, impulsive sympathy. He put his hand consolingly on Garion's shoulder. I'm sorry, he said, his voice almost breaking. It must have been a terrible loss. I was a baby, Garion shrugged, trying to sound offhand about it. I don't even remember them. It was still too personal to talk about. Some pestilence? Lildoran asked gently. No, Garion answered in the same flat tone. They were murdered. Lildoran gasped and his eyes went wide. A man crept into their village at night and set fire to their house, Garion continued unemotionally. My grandfather tried to catch him, but he got away. From what I understand, the man's a very old enemy of my family. Surely you're not going to let it stand like that, Lildoran demanded. No, Garion replied, still looking out into the fog. Soon as I'm old enough, I'm going to find him and kill him. Good lad, Lildoran exclaimed, suddenly catching Garion in a rough embrace. We'll find him and we'll cut him to pieces. We? I'll be going with you, of course, Lildoran declared. No, f no true friend could do any less. He was obviously speaking on impulse, but just as obviously he was totally sincere. He gripped Garion's hand firmly. I swear to you, Garion, I won't rest until the murderer of your parents lies dead at your feet. The sudden declaration was so totally predictable that Garion silently berated himself for not keeping his mouth shut. His feelings in the matter were very personal, and he was not really sure he wanted company in his search for his faceless enemy. Another part of his mind, however, rejoiced in Leldoran's impulsive but unquestioning support. He decided to let the matter drop. He knew Leldoran well enough by now to realize that the young man undoubtedly made a dozen devout promises a day, quickly offered in absolute sincerity, and just as quickly forgotten. They talked then of other things, standing close together beside the shattered wall, with their dark cloaks drawn tightly about them. Shortly before noon, Garion heard the muffled sound of horses hooves somewhere out in the forest. A few minutes later, Hetar materialized out of the fog, with a dozen wild-looking horses trailing after him. The tall Algar wore a short, fleece-lined leather cape. His boots were mud-spattered, and his clothes travel-stained, but otherwise he seemed unaffected by his two weeks in the saddle. Garion, he said gravely by way of greeting, and Garion and Laldoran stepped out to meet him. We've been waiting for you, Garion told him and introduced Lil Doran. We'll show you where the others are. Hedar nodded, 
and followed the two young men through the ruins of the tower, where Mr. Wolf and the others were waiting. Snow in the mountains, the Algar remarked laconically by way of explanation, as he swung down from his horse. It delayed me a bit. He pulled his hood back from his shaved head and took out his long, uh, shook out his long black scalp lock. No harm's been done, Mr. Wolf replied. Come inside to the fire and have something to eat. We've got a lot to talk about. Hedar, um, Hedar looked at the horses, his tan, weathered face growing strangely blank as if he were concentrating. The horses all looked back at him, their eyes alert and their ears pointed sharply forward. Then they turned and picked their way off among the trees. Won't they stray? Dernick wanted to know. No, Hedar answered. I asked them not to. Dernick looked puzzled, but he let it pass. They all went into the tower and sat near the fireplace. Aunt Paul cut dark bread and pale yellow cheese for them, while Dernick put more wood on the fire. Kohag sent word to the clan chiefs, Hedder reported, pulling off his cape. He wore a black, long-sleeved horsehide jacket with steel discs riveted to it to form a kind of flexible armor. They're gathering at the stronghold for council. He unbelted his curved saber he wore, laid it to one side, and sat near the fire to eat. Wolf nodded. Is anyone trying to get through to Prolgu? I sent a troop of my own men up to the Gorum before I left, Hedar responded. They'll get through, if anyone can. I hope so, Wolf stated. The Gorum is an old friend of mine, and I'll need his help before this is all finished. Aren't you people afraid of the land of the Elgos? Doran inquired politely. I've heard that there are monsters there that feed on the flesh of men. Hedar shrugged. They stay in their lairs in the winter time. Besides, they're seldom brave enough to attack a full troop of mounted men. He looked over at Mr. Wolf. Southern Sendari is crawling with Murgos. Or did you know that? I could have guessed, Wolf replied. Did they seem to be looking for anything in particular? I don't talk with Murgos, Hedar said shortly. His hooked nose and fierce eyes made him look at that moment like a hawk about to swoop down to the kill. I'm surprised you weren't delayed even more, Silk bantered. The whole world knows how you feel about Murgos. I indulged myself once, Hedar, Hedar admitted. I met two of them alone on the highway. It didn't take very long. Two less to worry about then, Barrett grunted with approval. I think it's time for some plain talk, Mr. Wolf said, brushing crumbs off the front of his tunic. Most of you have some notion of what we're doing, but I don't want anyone blundering into something by accident. We're after a man named Zadar. He used to be one of my master's disciples. Then he went over to Torak. Early last fall, he somehow slipped into the throne room at Riva and stole the orb of Aldur. We're going to chase him down and get it back. Isn't he a sorcerer too? Beric asked, tugging absently at a thick red braid. That's not a term we use, Wolf replied. But yes, he does have a certain amount of that kind of power. We all did. Me, Beltira and Belkira, Belsadar, all the rest of us. That's one of the things I wanted to warn you about. You all seem to have the same sort of names, Silk noticed. Our master changed our names when he took us as disciples. It was a simple change, but it meant a great deal to us. Wouldn't that mean that your original name was Gareth? Silk asked, his ferret eyes narrowing shrewdly. Mr. Wolf looked startled, then laughed. <laughs> I haven't heard that name for thousands of years. I've been Belgareth for so long that I'd almost completely forgotten Gareth. That's probably just as well. Gareth was a troublesome boy, a thief and a liar, among other things. Some things never change, Aunt Paul uh, observed. Nobody's perfect, Wolf admitted blandly. Why did Zadar steal the orb? Hedar asked, setting aside his plate. He's always wanted it for himself, the old man replied. That could be it, but more likely he's trying to take it to Torak. The one who delivers the orb to One Eye is going to be his favorite. But Torak's dead, Lildoran objected. The Riven Warder killed him at Vomember. No, Wolf said. Torak isn't dead, only asleep. Bran's sword wasn't the one destined to kill him. Zadar carried him off after the battle and hid him someplace. Someday he'll awaken, probably someday fairly soon, if I'm reading the signs right. We've got to get the orb back before that happens. This Zadar has caused a lot of trouble, Beric rumbled. You should have dealt with him a long time ago. Possibly, Wolf admitted. Why don't you just wave your hand and make him disappear? Beric suggested, making a sort of gesture with his thick fingers. Wolf shook his head. I can't. Not even the gods can do that. 
We've got some big problems then, Silk said with a frown. Every Murgo from here to Rat Goska is going to try to stop us from catching Zadar. Not necessarily, Wolf disagreed. Zadar's got the orb, but Katuchik commands the Grolems. Katuchik? Will Lorne asked. The Grolem High Priest. He and Zadar hate each other. I think we can count on him to try to keep Zadar from getting to Torak with the orb. Barrett shrugged. What difference does it make? You and Polgara can use magic if we run into anything difficult, can't you? There are limitations on that sort of thing, Wolf said a bit evasively. I don't understand, Beric said, frowning. Mr. Wolf took a deep breath. <sighs> All right, as long as it's come up, let's go into that too. Sorcery, if that's what you want to call it, is a disruption of the natural order of things. Sometimes it has certain unexpected effects, so you have to be very careful about what you do with it. Not only that, it makes... He frowned. Let's call it a sort of noise. That's not exactly what it is, but it serves well enough to explain. Others with the same abilities can hear that noise. Once Polgara and I start changing things, every Grolem in the West is going to know exactly where we are and what we're doing. They'll keep piling things in front of us until we're exhausted. It takes almost as much energy to do things that way as it does to do them with your arms and back, Aunt Paul explained. It's very tiring. She sat beside the fire, carefully mending a small tear in one of Garion's tunics. I didn't know that, Beric admitted. Not many people do. If we have to, Paul and I can take certain steps, Wolf went on. But we can't keep it up forever, and we can't simply make things vanish. I'm sure you can see why. Oh, of course, Silk professed, though his tone indicated he didn't. Everything that exists depends on everything else, Aunt Paul explained quietly. If you were to unmake one thing, it's altogether possible that everything would vanish. The fire popped, and Garion jumped slightly. The vaulted chamber seemed suddenly dark, and shadows lurked in the corners. That can't happen, of course, Wolf told them. When you try to unmake something, your will simply recoils on you. If you say, be not, then you're the one who vanishes. That's why we're very careful about what we say. I can understand why, Silk said, his eyes widening slightly. Most of the things we'll encounter can be dealt with by ordinary means, Wolf continued. That's the reason we brought you together. At least, that's one of the reasons. Among you, you'll be able to handle most of the things that get in our way. The important thing to remember is that Polgara and I have to get to Zadar before he can reach Torak with the orb. Zadar's found some way to touch the orb. I don't know how. If he can show Torax how it's done, no power on Earth will be able to stop One Eye from becoming king and god over the whole world. They all sat in the ruddy, flickering light of the fire, their faces serious as they considered that possibility. I think that pretty well covers everything, don't you, Paul? I believe so, Father, she replied, smoothing the front of her grey homespun gown. Later, outside the tower, uh, as grey evening crept in among the foggy ruins of Owasun, and the smell of the thick stew Aunt Paul was cooking for supper drifted out to them, Garion turned to Silk. Is it all really true? he asked. The small man looked out into the fog. Let's act as if we believe that it is, he suggested. Under the circumstances, I think it would be a bad idea to make a mistake. Are you afraid too, Silk? Garion asked. Silk sighed. <sighs> yes, he admitted. But we can behave as if we believe that we aren't, can't we? I guess we can try, Garion said. And the two of them turned to go back into the chamber at the foot of the tower, where the firelight danced on the low stone arches, holding the fog and the chill at bay. Oh, welcome and thank you for joining us, those of you who showed up during the uh, first chapter there, or rather, chapter two, the first chapter of this chapter of this evening. We're going to be continuing on for a while, reading a, a bit more pretty much until uh, until my voice gives out. I'm not sure how long it's going to be. I um, I was recording for several hours earlier today, but um, we'll see how it goes. <clears throat> Chapter 3 The next morning, Silk came out of the tower wearing a rich maroon doublet and bag-like black velvet cap, cocked jauntily over one ear. What's all that about? And Paul asked him. I chanced to cross an old friend in one of the packs, Silk replied airily. Radek of Boktor by name. What happened to Ambar of Kotu? Ambar's a good enough fellow, I suppose, Silk said a bit deprecatingly. But a Murgo named Asherak knows about him and may have dropped his name in certain quarters. Let's not look for trouble if we don't have to. Not a bad disguise, Mr. Wolf agreed. 
One more Drasnian merchant on the West Road can't attract any attention, whatever his name. Please, Silk objected in an injured tone. The name's very important. You hang the whole disguise on the name. I don't see any difference, Beric asserted bluntly. There's all the difference in the world. Surely you can see that Ambar's a vagabond with very little regard for ethics, while Raddick's a man of substance whose word is good in all the commercial centers of the West. Besides, Raddick's always accompanied by servants. Servants? One of Aunt Paul's eyebrows shot up. Just for the sake of the disguise, Silk assured her quickly. You, of course, could never be a servant, Lady Pulgara. Thank you. No one would ever believe it. You'll be my sister instead, traveling with me to see the splendors of Tall Haneth. Your sister? You could be my mother instead, if you prefer, Silk suggested blandly, making a religious pilgrimage to Mar Tarin to atone for a colorful past. Aunt Paul gazed steadily at the small man for a moment, while he grinned impudently at her. Someday your sense of humor is going to get you in a great deal of trouble, Prince Keldar. I'm always in trouble, Lady Polgara. I wouldn't know how to act if I weren't. Do you two suppose we could get started? Mr. Wolf asked. Just a moment more, Silk replied. If we meet anyone and have to explain things, you, Laldoran, and Garion are Polgara's servants. Hedar, Beric, and Durnik are mine. Anything you say, Wolf agreed wearily. There are reasons. All right. Don't you want to hear them? Not particularly. Silk looked a bit hurt. Are we ready? Wolf asked. Everything's out of the tower, Durnik told him. Oh, just a moment. I forgot to put out the fire. He went back inside. Wolf glanced after the smith in exasperation. What difference does it make? He muttered. The place is a ruin anyway. Leave him alone, father, Aunt Paul said placidly. It's the way he is. As they prepared to mount... Beric's horse, a large, sturdy grey, sighed and threw a reproachful look at Hetar, and the Algar chuckled. "'What's so funny?' Beric demanded suspiciously. "'The horse said something,' Hetar replied. "'Never mind.' Then they swung into their saddles, and threaded the way out of the foggy ruins and along the narrow, muddy track that wound into the forest. Sodden snow lay under the wet trees, and water dripped continually from the branches overhead. They all threw their cloaks about them to ward off the chill and the dampness. Once they were under the trees, Laldoran pulled his horse in beside Garion's and they rode together. Is Prince Keldar always so, well, extremely complicated? He asked. Silk? Oh yes, he's very devious. You see, he's a spy, and, he d his, and disguises and clever lies are second nature to him. A spy? Really? Laldoran's eyes bright brightened as he imagined... Mm, let me try that again. A spy? Really? Laldoran's eyes brightened as his imagination caught hold of the idea. He works for his uncle, the King of Drasnia, Garion explained. From what I understand, the Drasnians have been at this sort of thing for centuries. We've got to stop and pick up the rest of the packs, Silk was reminding Mr. Wolf. I haven't forgotten, the old man replied. Packs? Waldoran asked. Silk picked up some wool cloth and Kamar, Garion told him. He said it would give us a legitimate reason for, to be on the highway. We hid them in a cave when we left the road, to come to Vova soon. He thinks of everything, doesn't he? He tries. We're lucky to have him with us. Maybe we could have him show us uh, a few things about disguises, Laldoran suggested brightly. It might be very useful when we go looking for your enemy. Garion had thought Laldoran had forgotten his impulsive pledge. The young Aaron's mind seemed too flighty to keep hold of an idea for very long, but he saw now that Laldoran only seemed to forget things. The prospect of a serious search for his parents' murderer with this young enthusiast added, adding embellishments and improvisations at every turn began to present itself rather alarmingly. By mid-morning, after they'd picked up Silk's packs and lashed them to the backs of spare horses, they were back out on the Great West Road, the Tolnardrin Highway running through the heart of the forest. They rode south at a loping canter that ate up the miles. They passed a heavily burdened surf, clothed in scraps and pieces of sackcloth tied on with bits of string. The surf's face was gaunt, and he was very thin under his dirty rags. He stepped off the road and stared at them with apprehension as they passed. Garion felt a sudden stab of compassion. He briefly remembered Lammer and Detton, and he wondered what would finally happen to them. It seemed important for some reason. Is it really necessary to keep them so poor? he demanded of Laldoran, unable to hold it in any longer. Who? Laldoran asked, looking around. That surf. While Doran glanced back over his shoulder at the ragged man. You didn't even see him, Garion accused. Veldoran shrugged. There's so many. 
and they all dress in rags and live off the edge of starvation. Mimbrate taxes, Lildorn replied as if that explained everything. You seem to have always had enough to eat. I'm not a serf, Garion, Lildorn answered patiently. The poorest people always suffer the most. It's the way the world is. It doesn't have to be, Garion retorted. You just don't understand. No, and I never will. Naturally not, Lildorin said with infuriating complacency. You're not Arendish. Garion clenched his teeth to hold back the obvious reply. By late afternoon, they had covered ten leagues, and the snow had largely disappeared from the roadside. Shouldn't we start to give some thought to where we're going to spend the night, Father? Aunt Paul suggested. Mr. Wolf scratched thoughtfully at his beard as he squinted at the shadows hovering around the trees about them. I have an uncle who lives not far from here, Valdoran offered. Count Raldigan. I'm sure he'll be glad to give us shelter. Thin? Mr. Wolf asked. Dark hair? It's grey now, Valdoran replied. Do you know him? I haven't seen him in twenty years, Wolf told him. As I recall, he used to be quite the hothead. Uncle Raldigan? You must have him confused with somebody else, Belgarath. Maybe, Wolf said. How far is it to his house? No more than a league and a half away. Let's go see him then. Wolf decided. Valdoran shook his reins and moved into the lead to show them the way. How are you and your friend getting along? Silk asked, falling in beside Garion. Fine, I suppose, Garion replied, not quite sure how the rat-faced little man intended the question. It seems to be a little hard to explain things to him, though. It's only natural, Silk observed. He's an errand, after all. Garion quickly came to Valdoran's defense. He's honest and very brave. They all are. That's part of the problem. I like him, Garion asserted. So do I, Garion, but that doesn't keep me from realizing the truth about him. If you're trying to say something, why don't you just go ahead and say it? All right, I will. Don't let friendship get the better of your good sense. Arendia is a very dangerous place, and errands tend to blunder into disasters quite regularly. Don't let your exuberant young companion drag you into something that's none of your business. Silk's look was direct, and Garion realized the little man was quite serious. I'll be careful, he promised. I knew I could count on you, Silk said gravely. Are you making fun of me? Would I do that, Garion? Silk asked mockingly. Then he laughed, and they rode together on through the gloomy afternoon. The grey stone house of Count Reldigan was about a mile back from the forest on the highway, and it stood in the centre of a clearing that extended beyond bowshot in every direction. Although it had no wall, it somehow had the look of a fort. The windows facing out were narrow and covered with iron gratings. Strong turrets surmounted by battlements stood at each corner, and the gate which opened into the central courtyard of the house was made of whole tree trunks, squared off and strapped together with iron bands. Garion stared at the brooding pile as they approached in the rapidly fading light. There was a kind of haughty ugliness about the house, a grim solidity that seemed to defy the world. It's not a very pleasant place. Uh, it's not a very pleasant-looking sort of place, is it? He said to Silk. A stirring architecture is a reflection of their society, Silk replied. A strong house isn't a bad idea in a country where neighborhood disputes sometimes get out of hand. Are they also afraid of each other? Just cautious, Garion. Just cautious. Lildorn dismounted before the heavy gate and spoke to someone on the other side through a small grill. There was finally a rattling of chains and the grinding sound of heavy iron-shod bars sliding back. I wouldn't make any quick moves once we're inside, Silk advised quietly. There will probably be archers watching us. Garion looked at him sharply. A quaint custom of the region, Silk informed him. They rode into a cobblestone courtyard and dismounted. Count Raldigan, when he appeared, was a tall, thin man with iron-gray hair and beard who walked with the aid of a stout cane. He wore a rich green doublet and black hose. Despite the fact that he was in his own house, he carried a sword at his side. He limped heavily down a broad flight of stairs from the house to greet them. Uncle, Lildoran said, bowing respectfully. Nephew? The Count replied in polite acknowledgement. My friends and I found ourselves in the vicinity, Lildoran stated, and we thought we might impose on you for the night. You're always welcome, nephew, Raldigan answered with a kind of grave formality. Have you dined yet? No, uncle. Then you must all take supper with me. May I know your friends? Mr. Wolf pushed back his hood and stepped forward. You and I are already acquainted, Raldigan, he said. The Count's eyes widened. Belgareth, is it really you? Wolf grinned. Oh yes, I'm still wandering about the world, stirring up mischief. Raldigan laughed then and clasped, uh, grasped Wolf's upper arm warmly. 
Come inside, all of you. Let's not stand out in the cold. He turned and limped up the steps to the house. What happened to your leg? Wolf asked him. An arrow to the knee, the Count shrugged. The result of an old disagreement, long since forgotten. As I recall, you used to get involved in quite a few of those. I thought for a while you intended to go through life with your sword half-drawn. I was an excitable youth, the Count admitted, opening the broad door at the top of the steps. He led them down a long hallway to a room of imposing size, with a large, blazing fireplace at each end. Great curving stone arches supported the ceiling. The floor was of polished black stone scattered with fur rugs, and the walls, arches, and ceiling were whitewashed in gleaming contrast. Heavy, cur uh, heavy carved chairs of dark brown wood sat here and there, and a great table with an iron, iron candelabra at its centre stood near the fireplace at one end. A dozen or so leather-bound books were scattered on its polished surface. Books, Reldigan? Mr. Wolf said in amazement as he and the others removed their cloaks and gave them to the servants who immediately appeared. You have mellowed, my friend. The Count smiled at the old man's remark. I'm forgetting my manners, Wolf apologized. My daughter, Polgera. Paul, this is Count Reldigan, an old friend. My lady, the Count acknowledged with an exquisite bow. My house is honored. Aunt Paul was about to reply when two young men burst into the room, arguing heatedly. You're an idiot, Barentain, the first, a dark-haired youth in scarlet doublet snapped. It may please thee to think so, Torison, the, the second, a stout young man with pale curly hair and wearing a green and yellow striped tunic replied. But whether it please thee or not, a serious future is in the membrane hands. Thy rancorous denouncements and sulfurous rhetoric will not alter that fact. Don't thee me or thou me, Barentain, the dark-haired one sneered. Your imitation membrate courtesy turns my stomach. Gentlemen, that's enough, Count Raldigan said sharply, rapping his cane on the stone floor. If you two are going to insist on discussing politics, I'll have you separated, forcefully if necessary. The two young men scowled at each other, and then stalked off to opposite sides of the room. My son, Torison, the Count admitted apologetically, indicating the dark-haired youth, and his cousin, Barentain, the son of my late wife's brother, They've been wrangling like this for two weeks now. I had to take their swords away from them the day after Barentain arrived. Political discussion is good for the blood, my lord, Silk observed. Especially in the winter, the heat keeps the veins from clogging up. The Count chuckled at the little man's remark. Prince Keldar of the Royal House of Drasnia, Mr. Wolf introduced Silk. Your Highness, the Count responded, bowing. Silk winced slightly. Please, my lord, I spent a lifetime running from that mode of address. And I'm sure that my connection with the royal family embarrasses my uncle almost as much as it embarrasses me. The Count laughed again with easy good nature. Why don't we all adjourn to the dining table, he suggested. Two fat deer have been turning on spits in my kitchen since daybreak, and I recently obtained a cask of red wine from Sol southern Tolnadra. As I recall, Belgroth has always had a great fondness for good food and fine wines. He hasn't changed, my lord, Aunt Paul told him. My father is terribly predictable once you get to know him. The Count smiled and offered her his arm as they all moved toward a door on the far side of the room. Tell me, my lord, Aunt Paul said, do you by chance have a bathtub in your house? Bathing in the winter is dangerous, Lady Polgara, the Count warned her. My lord, she stated gravely, I've been bathing winter or summer for more years than you could possibly imagine. Let her bathe, Reldigan, Mr. Wolf urged. Her temper deteriorates quite noticeably when she thinks she's getting dirty. A bath wouldn't hurt you either, old wolf, and Paul re retorted tartly. You're starting to get a bit strong from the downwind side. Mr. Wolf looked a bit injured. Much later, after they'd eaten their fill of venison, gravy-soaked bread, and rich cherry tarts, Aunt Paul excused herself and went with the maidservant to oversee the preparation of her bath. The men all lingered at the table over their wine cups, their faces washed with the golden light of the many candles in Raldigan's dining hall. Let me show you to your rooms, Torison suggested to Leldorin and Garion, pushing back his chair and casting a look of veiled contempt across the table at Barentain. They followed him from the room and up a long flight of stairs toward the upper stories of the house. I don't want to offend you, Tor, Leldorin said as they climbed, but your cousin has some peculiar ideas. Torison snorted. Barentain's a jackass. He thinks he can impress the membrates by imitating their speech and by fawning on them. His dark face was angry in the light of the candle as he turned to light their way. Why would he want to? Lildoran asked. He's desperate for some kind of holding he can call his own, 
Torreson replied. My mother's brother has very little land to leave him. The fat idiot's all calf over the daughter of one of the barons in his district. And since the baron won't even consider a landless suitor, Barontine's trying to wheedle an estate from the Mimbrate governor. He'd swear fealty to the, to the ghost of Kaltoric himself if he thought it would get him land. Doesn't you realize he hasn't got a chance? Lildoran inquired. There are too many land-hungry Mimbrate knights around, around the governor for him to even think of granting an estate to an Asturian. I've told him the same thing myself, Torrison declared with scathing contempt. There's no reasoning with him. His behavior degrades our whole family. Veldoran shook his head commiseratingly as they reached an upper hall. He looked around quickly then. I have to talk with you, Tor, he blurted, his voice dropping to a whisper. Torrison looked at him sharply. My father's committed me to Belgarath's service in a matter of great importance. Veldoran hurried on in that same hushed voice. I don't know how long we'll be gone, so you and the others will have to kill uh, Korodelin without me. Torrison's eyes went wide with horror. We're not alone, Leldorin, he said in a strangled voice. I'll go down to the other end of the hall, Garion said quickly. No, Leldorin replied firmly, taking hold of Garion's arm. Garion's my friend, Tor. I've got no secrets from him. Leldorin, please, Garion protested. I'm not an Asturian. I'm not even an errand. I, I don't want to know what you're planning. But you will know, Garion, as proof of my trust in you, Leldorin declared. Next summer, when Korodolin journeys to the ruined city of Voastur to hold court there for six weeks, then maintain the fiction of horrendous unity, we're going to ambush him on the highway. Leldorin! Torrison gasped, his face turning white. But Leldorin was already plunging on. It won't just be a simple ambush, Garion. There will be a master stroke at, R at Mimbrate's heart. We're going to ambush him in the uniforms of Tolnardin legionnaires and cut him down with Tolnardin swords. Our attack will force Mimbrate to declare war on the Tolnardin Empire, and Tolnardor will crush Mimber like an eggshell. Mimber will be destroyed, and Asturia will be free. Nachak will have you killed for this, little Doran, Torrison cried. We've all been sworn to secrecy on a blood oath. Tell the Murgo I spit on his oath, little Doran said hotly. What need of Asturian patriots for a Murgo henchman? He's providing us with gold, you blockhead, Torrison raged almost beside himself. We need his good red gold to buy the uniforms, the swords, and to strengthen the backbones of some of, some of our weaker friends. I don't need weaklings with me, Leldorin said intensely. A patriot does what he does for love of his country, not for anger at gold. Garion's mind was moving quickly now. His moment of stunned amazement had passed. There was a man in Cherik, he recalled, the Earl of Yarvik. He also took Murgo gold and plotted to kill a king. The two stared at him blankly. Something happens to a country when you kill its king, Garion explained. No matter how bad the king is, or how good the people are who kill him, the country falls apart for a while. Everything's confused, and there's nobody to point the country in any one direction. Then if you start a war between that country and another one at the same time, you add just that much more confusion. I think that if I were a Murgo, that's exactly the kind of confusion I'd want to see in all the kingdoms of the West. Gary listened to his own voice almost in amazement. There was a dry, dispassionate quality in it that he instantly recognized. From the time of his earliest memories, that voice had always been there, inside his mind, occupying some quiet, hidden corner, telling him when he was wrong or foolish. But the voice had never actively interfered before in his dealings with other people. Now, however, it spoke directly to these two young men, patiently explaining. Angerat gold isn't what it seems to be, he went on. There's a kind of power in it that corrupts you. Maybe that's why it's the color of blood. I'd think about that before I accepted any more red gold from this Murgo Nachak. Why do you suppose he's giving you gold and helping you with this plan of yours? He's not an Asturian, so patriotism couldn't have anything to do with it, could it? I'd think about that, too. Leldoran and his cousin looked suddenly troubled. I'm not going to say anything about this to anybody, Garion said. You told me about it in confidence, and I really wasn't supposed to hear about it anyway. But remember that there's a lot more going on in the world right now than what's happening here in Arendia. Now I think I'd like to get some sleep. If you'll show me where my bed is, I'll leave you to talk things over all night if you'd like. All in all, Garion thought he'd handled the whole thing rather well. He planted a few doubts at the very least. He knew Aaron's well enough by now to realize that it probably wouldn't be enough to turn these two around, but it was a start. Well, welcome. It's okay if you showed up a little bit late. Um, if you missed the first uh, half hour, you can always rewind. I'll be posting this up later on my YouTube channel, so 
um, if you want to catch any of the bits that you've missed tonight or if you want to anyone who's missed um, the previous episodes and want to get caught up with the, the first book of the series can do so I'll be um, I'll be keeping the playlist up with all of the uh, readings for now we are going to push ahead with chapter four the following morning, they rode out early, while the mists still hung among the trees. Count Reldigan, wrapped in a dark cloak, stood at his gate to bid them farewell, and Torison, standing beside his father, seemed unable to take his eyes off Garion's face. Garion kept his expression as blank as possible. The fiery young Asturian seemed to be filled with doubts, and those doubts might keep him from plunging headlong into something disastrous. It wasn't much, Garion realized but it was the best he could manage under, under the circumstances. Come back soon, Belgareth, Reldigan said. Sometime when you can stay longer. We're very isolated here, and I'd like to know what the rest of the world's doing. We'll sit by the fire and talk away a month or two. Mr. Wolf nodded gravely. Maybe when this business of mine is over, Reldigan. Then he turned his horse and led the way across the wide clearing that surrounded Reldigan's house, and back once again into the gloomy forest. The Count's an unusual errand, Silk said lightly as they rode along. I think I actually detected an original thought or two in him last evening. He's changed a great deal, Wolf agreed. You said it's a good table, Beric said. I haven't felt this full since I left Balalorn. You should, Aunt Paul told him. You ate the biggest part of one deer by yourself. You're exaggerating, Polgara, Beric said. But not by very much, Hedor observed in his quiet voice. Laldorn had pulled his horse in beside Garion's, but he hadn't spoken. His face was as troubled as his cousin's had been. It was obvious that he wanted to say something, and just as obvious that he didn't know how to begin. Go ahead, Garion said quietly. We're good enough friends, I'm not going to be upset if it doesn't come out quite exactly right. Laldorn looked a little sheepish. Am I really that obvious? Honest is a better word for it, Garion told him. You've just never learned to hide your feelings, that's all. Was it really true? Lildoran blurted. I'm not doubting your word, but was there really a Murgo and Sherrick plotting against King Anheg? Ask Silk, Carrion suggested. Or Beric, or, or Hedar, any of them. We were all there. Nechek isn't like that, though, Lildoran said quickly, defensively. Can you be sure? Carrion asked him. The plan was his in the first place, wasn't it? How did you happen to meet him? We'd all gone, we'd all gone down to the Great Fair, Taurus and me, several of the others. We bought some things from a Murgo merchant, and Tor made a few remarks about Mimbrates. You know how Tor is. The merchant said that he knew someone we, we might be interested in meeting, and he introduced us to Nachak. The more, more we talked to him, the more sympathetic he seemed to become to the way we felt. Naturally. He told us what the king is planning. You wouldn't believe it. Probably not. Lil Doran gave them a quick, troubled look. He's going to break up our estates and give them to landless Mimbrate nobles, he said it accusingly. Did you verify that with anyone but Najak? How could we? The Mimbrates wouldn't admit it if confronted with if we confronted them with it, but it's the kind of thing Mimbrates would do. So you've only got Najak's word for it. How did this plan of yours come up? Najak said that he, if he were an Asturian, he wouldn't let anyone take his land, but he said that it'd be too late to try to stop them when they come with knights and soldiers. He said that if he were doing it, he'd strike before they were ready, and that he'd do it in such a way that the Mimbrates wouldn't know who done it. That's when he suggested the Tolnerton uniforms. When did he start giving you money? I'm not sure. Tor handled that part of it. Did he ever say why he was giving you money? He said it was out of friendship. Didn't that seem a little odd? I give someone money out of friendship, while Doran protested. You're an, you're an Asturian, Garion told him. You'd give someone your life out of friendship. Nechek's a Murgo, though, and I've never heard that they're all that generous. What it comes down to, then, is that a stranger tells you that the king's planning to take your land. Then he gives you a plan to kill the king and start a war with Tolnadra. And to make sure you succeed with his plan, he gives you money. Is that about it? Well, Doran nodded mutely, his eyes stricken. Weren't any of you the least bit suspicious? Well, Doran seemed almost about to cry. It's such a good plan, he burst out finally. It couldn't help but succeed. That's what makes it so dangerous, Garin replied. Garion, what am I going to do? Lil Doran's voice was anguished. I don't think there's anything you can do right now, Garion told him. Maybe later, after we've had time to think about it, we'll come up with something. If we can't, we can always tell my grandfather about it. He'll think of a way to stop it. We can't tell anybody, Lil Doran reminded him. 
We're pledged to silence. We might have to break that pledge, Garion said somewhat reluctantly. I don't see that either of us owes that Murgo anything, but it's going to have to be up to you. I won't say anything to anybody without your permission. You decide, Lildoran pleaded then. I can't do it, Garion. You're going to have to, Garion told him. I'm sure if you think about it, you'll see why. They reached the Great West Road then, and Beric led them south at a brisk trot, cutting off the possibility of further discussion. A league or so down the road, they passed a muddy village, a dozen or so turf-roofed huts, with walls made of wattles plastered over with mud. The fields around the village were dotted with tree stumps, and a few scrawny cows grazed near the edge of the forest. Garion couldn't control his indignation as they looked at the misery implicit in the crude collection of hovels. Lildorn, he said sharply. Look. What? Where? The blonde young man came out of his troubled preoccupation quickly, as if expecting some danger. The village, Garion told him. Look at it. It's only a Cerse village, Lildorn said indifferently. I've seen hundreds like it. He seemed ready to return to his own inner turmoil. In Sandaria, we wouldn't keep pigs in places like that. Garion's voice rang with fervor. If he could only make his friends see. Two ragged serfs were dispiritedly hacking chunks of firewood from one of the stumps near the road. As the party approached, they dropped their axes and bolted in terror for the forest. Does it make you proud, Lildorn? Garion demanded. Does it make you feel good to know that your own countrymen are so afraid of you that they run from the very sight of you? Lildorn looked baffled. They're serfs, Garion, he said as if that explained. They're men. They're not animals. Men deserve to be treated better. I can't do anything about it. They aren't my serfs. And with that, Lildorn's attention turned inward again, as he continued to struggle with the dilemma Garion had placed upon him. By late afternoon, they'd covered ten leagues, and the cloudy sky was gradually darkening as evening approached. I think we're going to have to spend the night in the forest, Belgareth, Silk said, looking around. There's no chance of reaching the next Tongerton hostel. Mr. Wolf had been half dozing in his saddle. He looked up, blinking a bit. All right, he replied, but let's get back from the road a bit. Our fire could attract attention, and too many people know we're in Arendia already. There's a woodcutter's track right there. Dernick pointed to a break in the trees just ahead. It should lead us back to the trees. All right, Wolf agreed. The sound of their horses' hooves was muffled by the sodden leaves on the forest floor as they turned in among the trees to follow the narrow track. They rode silently for the better part of a mile, until a clearing opened ahead of them. How about here? Dernick asked. He indicated a brook trickling softly over the mossy stones on one side of the clearing. It'll do, Wolf agreed. We're going to need shelter, the smith observed. I brought tents and Kamar, Silk told him. They're in the packs. That was foresighted of you, and Paul complimented him. I've been in Orendia before, my lady. I'm familiar with the weather. Gary and I will get wood for a fire, then, Dernick said, climbing down from his horse and untying his axe from the saddle. I'll help you, Lildoran offered, his face still troubled. Dernick nodded and led the way off into the trees. The woods were soaked, but the smith seemed to know almost instinctively where to find dry fuel. They worked quickly in the lowering twilight, and soon had three large bundles of limbs and faggots. They returned to the clearing where Silk and the others were erecting several dun-colored tents. Dernick dropped the wood and cleared a space for the fire with his foot. Then he knelt and began striking sparks with his knife from a, a piece of flint into a wad of dry tinder he always carried. In a short time, he had a small fire going, and Aunt, Aunt Paul set out her pots beside it, humming softly to herself. Hedar came back from tending the horses, and they all stood back watching Aunt Paul prepare supper from the stores Count Raldigan had pressed on them before they'd left his house that morning. After they'd eaten, they sat around the fire talking quietly. How far have we come today? Dernick asked. Twelve leagues, Hedar estimated. How much farther do we have? To, uh, how much farther do we have to get out of the forest? It's eighty leagues from Kamar to the central plain, Lildorn replied. Dernick sighed. A week or more. I'd hoped it'd only be a few days. I don't know what you mean, Dernick. Beric agreed. No, I know what you mean, Dernick. Beric agreed. It's gloomy under all these trees. The horses picketed near the brook stirred uneasily. Uneasily, Hedar rose to his feet. Something wrong? Beric asked, also rising. They shouldn't be. Hedar started, then he stopped. Back! He snapped. Away from the fire. The horses say there are men out there. Men. Many, with weapons. He jumped back from the fire, drawing his saber. Lildoran took one startled look at him and bolted for one of the tents. 
Garion's sudden disappointment in his friend was almost like a blow to the stomach. An arrow buzzed into the light and shattered on Beric's mail shirt. Arm yourselves! The big man roared, drawing his sword. Garion grasped Aunt Paul's sleeve and tried to pull her from the light. Stop that, she snapped, jerking her sleeve free. Another arrow whizzed out of the foggy woods. Aunt Paul flicked her hand as if brushing away a fly and muttered a single word. The arrow bounced back as if it had struck something solid and fell to the ground. Then, with a hoarse shout, a gang of rough, burly men burst from the edge of the trees and splashed across the brook, brandishing swords. As Beric and Hedar leapt forward to meet them, Leldorn re-emerged from the tent with his bow and began loosing arrows so rapidly that his hands seemed to blur as they moved. Garion was instantly ashamed that he doubted his friend's courage. <clears throat> With a choked cry, one of the attackers stumbled back, an arrow through his throat. Another doubled over sharply, clutching at his stomach, and fell to the ground, groaning. A third, quite young, with a pale, downy beard on his cheeks, dropped heavily and sat plucking at the feathers of the shaft protruding from his chest, with a bewildered expression on his boyish face. Then he sighed and slumped over on his side, with a stream of blood coming from his nose. The ragged-looking men faltered under the rain of Laldoran's arrows, and then Beric and Hedar were upon them. With a great sweep, Beric's heavy sword shattered an upflung blade and crunched down and into the angle between the neck and shoulder of the black-whiskered man who'd held it. The man collapsed. Hedar made a quick feint with a saber, then ran it smooth smoothly through the body of a pockmarked ruffian. The man stiffened, and a gush of bright blood burst from his mouth as Hedar pulled out his blade. Dernick ran forward with his axe, and Silk drew his long dagger from under his vest and ran directly at a man with a shaggy brown beard. At the last moment, he dived forward, rolled, and struck the bearded man full in the chest with both feet. Without pausing, he came up and ripped his dagger into, in, into his enemy's belly. The dagger made a wet tearing sound as it sliced upward, and the stricken man clutched at his stomach with a scream, trying to hold in the blue-colored loops and coils of his entrails that seemed to come boiling out through his fingers. Garion dived for the packs to get his own sword, but was suddenly grabbed roughly from behind. He struggled for an instant, then felt a stunning blow on the back of his head and his eyes filled with a blinding flash of light. This is the one we want, a rough voice husked as Garion sank into unconsciousness. <clears throat> he was being carried, that much was certain. He could feel the strong arms under him. He didn't know how long it had been since he'd been struck on the head. His ears still rang, and he was more than a little stick to his stomach. He stayed limp, but carefully opened one eye. His vision was blurred and uncertain, but he could make out Beric's bearded face looming above him in the darkness, and merged with it as once before in the snowy woods outside Valalorn, he seemed to see the shaggy face of a great bear. He closed his eyes, shuddered, and started to struggle weakly. It's all right, Garion, Beric said, his voice sunk in a kind of despair. It's me. Garion opened his eyes again, and the bear seemed to be gone. He wasn't even sure if he'd really seen it. Are you all right? Beric asked, setting him on the ground. It hit me on the head, Garion mumbled, his hand going to the swelling behind his ear. They won't do it again, Beric muttered, his tone still despairing. Then the huge man sank to the ground and buried his face in his hands. It was dark and difficult to see, but it looked as if Beric's shoulders were shaking with a kind of terrible suppressed grief, a soundless, wrenching series of convulsive sobs. Where are we? Garion asked, looking around into the darkness. Beric coughed and wiped at his face. Quite a ways from the tents. It took me a little while to catch up to the two who were carrying you off. What happened? Garion was still a bit confused. They're dead. Can you stand up? I don't know. Garion tried to get up. But a wave of giddiness swept over him and his stomach churned. Never mind. I'll carry you. Beric said in a now grimly practical voice. An owl screeched from a nearby tree and its ghostly white shape drifted off into the trees ahead of them. As Beric lifted him, Garion closed his eyes and concentrated on keeping his stomach under control. Before long, they came out into the clearing in its circle of firelight. Is he all right? Aunt Paul asked, looking up from bandaging a cut on Dernick's arm. A bump on the head is all, Beric replied, setting Garion down. Did you run them off? His voice was harsh, even brutal. Those who could still run, Sulk answered his voice a bit excited and his ferret eyes bright. Had they left a few behind? He pointed to a number of still shapes lying near the edge of the firelight. Laldoran came back into the clearing, looking over his shoulder with his bow half-drawn. 
He was out of breath, his face was pale, and his hands were shaking. Are you all right? he asked as soon as he saw Garion. Garion nodded, gently fingering the lump behind his ear. I tried to find the, the two who took you, the young man declared, but they were too quick for me. There was some kind of animal out there. I heard it growling while I was looking for you. Awful growls. The beast is gone now, Beric told him flatly. What's the matter with you? Sulk asked the big man. Nothing. Who were those men? Garion asked. Robbers, most likely, Silk surmised, putting away his dagger. It's one of the benefits of a society that holds men in serfdom. They get bored with being serfs and go into the forest looking for excitement and profit. You sound just like Garion, Haldoran objected. Can't you people understand that serfdom is part of the natural order of things here? Our serfs couldn't take care of themselves alone, so those of us higher in station accept the responsibility of caring for them. Of course you do, Silk agreed sarcastically. They're not so well fed as your pigs, nor as well kenneled as your dogs, but you do care for them, don't you? That'll do, Silk, Aunt Paul said coolly. Let's not start bickering among ourselves. She tied a last knot on Dernick's bandage and came over to examine Garion's head. She touched her fingers gently to the lump, and he winced. It doesn't seem too serious, she observed. It hurts all the same, he complained. Of course it does, dear, she said calmly. She dipped a cloth into a pail of cold water and held it to the lump. You're going to have to learn to protect your head, Garion. If you keep banging it like this, you're going to soften your brains. Garion was about to answer that, but Hedhar and Mr. Wolf came back into the firelight just then. They're still running, Hedhar announced. The steel discs on his horsehide jacket gleamed red in the flickering light, and his saber was streaked with blood. They seem to be awfully good at that part of it, Wolf said. Is everyone all right? A few bumps and bruises is about all, Aunt Paul told him. It could have been much worse. Well, let's not start worrying about what could have been. Shall we remove those? Barrett growled, pointing at the bodies littering the ground near the brook. Shouldn't they be buried? Dernick asked. His voice shook a little, and his face was very pale. Too much trouble, Barrett said bluntly. Their friends can come back later and care for it, if they feel like it. Isn't that just a little uncivilized? Dernick objected. Barrett shrugged. It's customary. Mr. Wolf rolled one of the bodies over and carefully examined the dead man's grey face. Looks like an ordinary Arendish outlaw, he grunted. It's hard to say for sure, though. Lildoran was retrieving his arrows, carefully pulling them out of the bodies. Let's drag them all over their ways, Beric said to Hedhar. I'm getting tired of looking at them. Dernick looked away, and Garion saw two great tears standing in his eyes. Does it hurt, Dernick? He asked sympathetically, sitting on the log beside his friend. I killed one of those men, Garion, the smith replied in a shaking voice. I hit him in the face with my axe. He screamed and his blood splashed all over me. Then he fell down and kicked on the ground with his heels until he died. You didn't have any choice, Dernick, Garion told him. They were trying to kill us. I've never killed anyone before, Dernick said, the tears now running down his face. He kicked the ground for such a long time, such a terribly long time. Why don't you go to bed, Garion? Aunt Paul suggested firmly. Her eyes were on Dernick's tear-streaked face. Garion understood. Good night, Dernick, he said. He got up and started towards one of the tents. He glanced back once. Aunt Paul had seated herself on the log beside the smith and was speaking quietly to him with one of her arms comfortingly, comfortingly about his shoulders. Oh. You have to excuse me there. Uh, sometimes bits of this book kind of sneak up and get me. Uh, I just, I really like Dernick as a character. He's, um, like, he's such a solid guy, but, um, you know, you can see just what a good person he is. These people are trying to kill him and all of his friends, but he's still, um, still sad, still moved to tears by having to defend himself. Oh, it gets me. Chokes me out. All right, we can probably do one more chapter here before we're going to need to call it a night. I can feel my voice starting to get tired a little bit. But we can push ahead for a little bit more. Chapter 5. The fire had burned down to a tiny orange flicker outside of the tent. 
and the forest around the clearing was silent. Garion lay with a throbbing head trying to sleep. Finally, long past midnight, he gave it up. He slid out from under his blanket and went searching for Aunt Paul. Above the silvery fog, a full moon had risen, and its light made the, made the mist luminous. The air around him seemed almost to glow as he picked his way carefully through the silent camp. He scratched on the outside of her tent flap and whispered, Aunt Paul? There was no answer. Aunt Paul, he whispered a bit louder. It's me, Garion. Can I come in? There was still no answer, nor even the faintest sound. Carefully, he pulled back the flap and peered inside. The tent was empty. <laughs> Puzzled, even a bit alarmed, he turned and looked around the clearing. Hedar stood watch not far from the picketed horses, his hawk face turned toward the, sog the, the foggy forest and his cape drawn about him. Garion hesitated a moment and then stepped quietly behind the tents. He angled down through the trees and the filmy, luminous fog toward the brook, thinking that if he bathed his aching head in the cold water, it might help. He was about 50 yards from the tents when he saw faint movement among the trees ahead. He stopped. A huge gray wolf padded out of the fog and stopped in the center of a small open space among the trees. Garion drew in his breast sharply and froze beside a large, twisted oak. The wolf sat down on the damp leaves as if he were waiting for something. The glowing fog illuminated details Garion wouldn't have been able to see on an ordinary night. The wolf's ruff and shoulders were silvery, and his muzzle was shot with gray. He carried his age with enormous dignity, and his yellow eyes seemed calm and very wise somehow. Garion stood absolutely still. He knew that the slightest sound would instantly reach the sharp ears of the wolf, but it was more than that. The blow behind his ear had made him lightheaded, and the strange glow of the moon-drenched fog made this encounter seem somehow unreal. He found that he was holding his breath. A large snowy white owl swooped over the open space among the trees on ghosting wings, settling on a low branch and perched there, looking down at the wolf with an unblinking stare. The gray wolf looked calmly back at the perched bird. Then, though there, were, there was no breath of wind, it seemed somehow that a sudden eddy in the shimmering fog made the figures of the owl and the wolf hazy and indistinct. When it cleared again, Mr. Wolf stood in the center of the opening, and Aunt Paul in her gray gown was seated rather sedately on the limb above him. It's been a long time since we've hunted together, Polgara, the old man said. Yes, it has, father. She raised her arms and pushed her fingers through the long, dark weight of her hair. I'd almost forgotten what it was like. She seemed to shudder then in a, in a strange kind of pleasure. It's a very good night for it. A little damp, he replied, shaking one foot. It's very clear above the treetops, and the stars are particularly bright. It's a splendid night for flying. I'm glad you enjoyed yourself. Did you happen to remember that you were supposed to be doing? Don't be sarcastic, father. Well, there's no one in the vicinity but errands, and most of them are asleep. You're sure? Of course. There isn't a growl for five, le five leagues in any direction. Did you find the ones you were looking for? They weren't hard to follow, Wolf answered. They're staying in a cave about three leagues deeper into the forest. Another one of them died on their way back there, and a couple more probably won't live until morning. The rest of them seemed a little bitter about the way things turned out. I can imagine. Did you get close enough to hear what they were saying? He nodded. There's a man in one of the villages nearby who watches the road and lets them know when somebody passes by who might be worth robbing. Then they're just ordinary thieves. Not exactly. They were watching for us in particular. We'd all been described to them in rather complete detail. I think I'll go talk to this villager, she said grimly. She flexed her fingers in an unpleasantly suggestive manner. It's not worth the time it would take, Wolf told her, scratching thoughtfully at his beard. All I'd be able to tell you was that some Murgo offered him gold. Grollums don't bother to explain very much to their hirelings. We should attend to him, father she insisted. We don't want him lurking behind us, trying to buy up every brigand in Arendia to send after us. After tomorrow, he won't buy much of anything, Wolf replied with a short laugh. <laughs> his friends plan to lure him out into the woods in the morning and cut his throat for him, among other things. Good. I'd like to know who the Grollum is, though. Wolf shrugged. What difference does it make? There are dozens of them in northern Arendia, all stirring up as much trouble as they can. They know what's coming as well as we do. We can expect that we can't expect them to just sit back and let us pass. Shouldn't we put a stop to it? We don't have the time, he said. It takes forever to explain things to errands. If we move fast enough, maybe we can slip by before the Grollums are ready. And if we can't? Then we'll do it the other way. 
I've got to get to Zadar before he crosses into Thalmurgos. If too many things get in my way, I'll have to be more direct. You should have done that from the beginning, Father. Sometimes you're too delicate about things. Are you going to start that again? That's always your answer to everything, Polgera. You're forever fixing things that would fix themselves if you just leave them alone, and changing things that don't have to be changed. Don't be cross, Father. Help me down. Why not fly down, he suggested. Don't be absurd. Garion slipped away among the mossy trees, trembling violently as he went. When Aunt Paul and Mr. Wolf returned to the clearing, they roused the others. I think we'd better move on, Wolf told them. We're a little vulnerable out here. It's safer on the highway, and I'd like to get past this particular stretch of woods. The dismantling of their night's encampment took less than an hour, and they started back along the woodcutter's track toward the Great West Road. Though it was still some hours before dawn, the moon-bathed fog filled the night with misty luminosity, and it seemed almost as if they rode through a shining cloud that had settled among the dark trees. They reached the highway and turned south again. I'd like to be a good way from here when the sun comes up, Wolf said quietly, but we don't want to blunder into anything, so keep your eyes and ears open. They set off at a canter and covered a good three leagues by the time the fog had begun to turn a pearly grey with the approach of morning. As they rounded a broad curve, Hetar suddenly raised his arm, signaling for a halt. What's wrong? Beric asked him. Horses ahead, Hetar replied, coming this way. Are you sure? I don't hear anything. Forty, at least, Hetar answered firmly. There, Dernick said, his head cocked to one side. Hear that? Faintly, they all heard a jingling clatter some distance off in the fog. We could hide in the woods until they pass, Doran suggested. It's better to stay on the road, Wolf replied. Let me handle it, Silk said confidently, moving into the lead. I've done this sort of thing before. They proceeded at a careful walk. The riders who emerged from the fog were encased in steel. They wore full suits of polished armor and round helmets with pointed visors that make them look strangely like huge insects. They carried long lances with colored pennons on their tips, and their horses were massive beasts, also encased in armor. Mimbrate knights, Weldorn snarled, his eyes going flat. Keep your feelings to yourself, Wolf told the young man. If any of them say anything to you, answer, answer in such a way they'll think you're a Mimbrate sympathizer, like young Barentain back at your uncle's house. Weldorn's face hardened. Doozy tells you, Weldorn, Aunt Paul said, this isn't the time for heroics. Hold! the leader of the armored column commanded, lowering his lance until the steel point was leveled at them. Let one come forward that I may speak with him. The knight's tone was peremptory. Silk moved toward the steel-cased man, his smile ingratiating. We're glad to see you, sir knight, he lied glibly. We were set upon by robbers last night, and we've been riding in fear of our lives. What is thy name? the knight, command the knight demanded, raising his visor. And who are these who accompany thee? I'm Radic of Boktor, my lord. Silk answered, bowing and pulling off his velvet cap. A merchant of Drasnia, bound for Tolhaneth, with Sandarian woolens in hope of catching the winter market. The armored man's eyes narrowed suspiciously. Thy party seems overlarge for so simple an undertaking, worthy merchant. Uh, the three here are my servants, Silk told him, pointing at Beric, Hetar, and Dernick. The old man and the boy serve my sister, a widow of independent means who accompanies me so she might visit Tolhaneth. What of the other? The knight pressed. The Asturian. A young nobleman traveling to Vomimber to visit friends there, he graciously consented to guide us through the forest. The knight's suspicion seemed to relax a bit. Thou madest mention of robbers, he said. Where did this ambush take place? About three or four leagues back. They set upon us after we'd made our night's encampment. We managed to beat them off, but my sister was terrified. This province of Asturia seethes, this province of Asturia seethes with rebellion and brigandage, the knight said sternly. My men and I are sent to suppress such offenses. Come here, Asturian. Weldoran's nostrils flared, but he obediently came forward. I will request my, thy name of thee. My name is Leldoran, Sir Knight. How may I serve thee? These robbers thy friend spoke of. Were they commons or men of quality? Serfs, my lord, Leldoran replied. Ragged and uncouth, doubtless fled from lawful submission to their masters to take up, up, to take up outlawry in the forest. How may we expect duty and proper submission from serfs when nobles raise detestable rebellion against the crown? The knight asserted. Truly, my lord, Lildoran agreed with a show of sadness that was a trifle overdone. Much have I argued that selfsame point with those who speak endlessly of membrane oppression and o'erweening arrogance, 
My appeals for reason and dutiful respect for his majesty, our lord king, however, are greeted with derision and cold despite. He sighed. Thy wisdom becomes thee, young Eldoran, the knight approved. Regretfully I must detain thee and thy companions, in order that we may verify certain details. Sir knight, Silk uh, protested vigorously, a change in the weather could destroy the value of my merchandise in Tolhaneth. I pray you don't delay me. I regret the necessity, good merchant, the knight replied, but Asturia is filled with dis dissemblers and plotters. I can permit, permit none to pass without meticulous examination. There was a stir at the rear of the membrate column. In single file, resplendent in burnished breastplates, plumed helmets, and crimson capes, a half a hundred Tolhaneth legionnaires rode slowly along the flank of the armored knights. What seems to be the problem here? The legion commander, a lean, leather-faced man of forty or so, asked politely as he stopped not far from Silk's horse. We do not require the assistance of the legions in this matter, the knight said coldly. Our orders are from Vomember. We are sent to help restore order in Asturia, and we were questioning these travelers to that end. I have a great respect for order, sir knight, the Tolnardon replied. But the security of the highway is my responsibility. He looked inquiringly at Silk. I'm Radic of Boktor, Captain, Silk told him. A Drasnian merchant bound for Tolhaneth. I have documents if you wish to see them. Documents are easily forged, the knight declared. So they are, the Tolnardon agreed. But to save time, I make it a practice to accept all documents at face value. A Drasnian merchant with goods in his packs has a legitimate reason to be on an imperial highway, Sir Knight. There's no reason to detain them, is there? We seek to stamp out banditry and rebellion, the knight asserted hotly. Stamp away, the captain said, but off the highway, if you don't mind. By treaty, the imperial highway is Tolnardon territory. What you do once you're 50, 50 yards back in the trees is your affair. What happens on the road is mine. I'm certain that no true membrate knight would want to humiliate his king by violating a solemn agreement between the horrendous crown and the emperor of Tolnadra, would he? The knight looked at him helplessly. I think you should proceed, good merchant, the Tolnadron told Silk. I know that all Talhaneth awaits your arrival breathlessly. Silk grinned at him and bowed floridly in his saddle. Then he gestured to the others, and they all rode slowly past the fuming membrate knight. After they'd passed, the legionnaires closed ranks across the highway, effectively cutting off any pursuit. Good man there, Beric said. I don't think much of Tolnardon's ordinarily, but that one's different. Let's move right along, Mr. Wolf said. I'd rather not have those knights doubling back on us after the Tolnardons leave. They pushed their horses into a gallop and rode on, leaving the knights behind, arguing heatedly with the legion commander in the middle of the road. They stayed that night at a thick-walled Tolnardon hostel, and for perhaps the first time in his life, Garion bathed without the insistence or even the suggestion from his aunt. Though he'd not had the chance to become directly involved in the fight of the, in the clearing the night before, he felt somehow as if he were spattered with blood or worse. He'd not before realized how grotesquely men could be mutilated in close fighting. Watching a living man dismembered or brained had filled him with a kind of deep shame that the ultimate inner secrets of the human body could be so grossly exposed. He felt unclean. He removed his clothing in the chilly bathhouse and, even without thinking, the silver amulet that Mr. Wolf and Aunt Paul had given him and then he entered the steaming tub where he scrubbed at his skin with a coarse brush and strong soap, much harder than even the most meticulous obsession with personal cleanliness would have required. For the next several days they moved southward at a steady pace, stopping each night at the evenly spaced Tolnardon hostels, where the presence of the hard-faced Tolnardon uh, legionnaires was a continual reminder that all the might of Imperial Tolnardra guaranteed the safety of travelers who sought refuge there. On the sixth day after the fight of the forest, however, Laldoran's horse pulled up lame. Dernick and Hetar, under Aunt Paul's supervision, spent several hours brewing poultices over a small fire from the roadside and applying steaming compresses to the animal's leg, while Wolf fumed at the delay. By the time the horse was fit to continue, they all realized there was no chance to reach the next hostel before dark. Well, old Wolf, Aunt Paul said after they'd remounted, what now? Do we ride on at night, or do we try to take shelter in the forest again? I haven't decided, Wolf answered shortly. If I remember right, there's a village not far ahead. Laldoran, now mounted on an Algar horse, stated, It's a poor place, but I think it has an inn, of sorts. That sounds ominous, Silk said. What exactly do you mean by of sorts? The lord of this domain is notoriously greedy, Laldoran replied. His taxes are crushing, and his people have little left for themselves. The inn isn't good. 
We'll have to chance it, Wolf decided, and led them off at a brisk trot. As they approached the village, the heavy clouds began to clear off, and the sun broke through wanly. The village was even worse than Leldoran's description had led them to believe. A half-dozen ragged beggars stood in the mud on the outskirts, their hands held out imploringly and their voices shrill. The houses were nothing more than rude hovels oozing smoke from the pitiful fires within. Scrawny pigs rooted in the muddy streets, and the stench of the place was awful. A funeral procession slogged through the mud toward the burial ground on the other side of the village. The corpse, carried on a board, was wrapped in a ragged brown blanket, and the richly robed and cowled priests of Sheldon, the Arendish god, chanted an age-old hymn that had much to do with war and vengeance, but little to do with comfort. The widow, a whimpering infant at her breast, followed by the body, her, her face blank and her eyes dead. The inn smelled of stale beer and half-rotten food. A fire had destroyed one end of the common room, charring and blackening the low-beamed ceiling. The gaping hole in the burned wall was curtained off with a sheet of rotting canvas. The fire pit in the center of the room smoked, and the, hard, the hard-faced innkeeper was surly. For supper, he offered only bowls of watery gruel, a mixture of barley and turnips. Charming, Silk said sardonically, pushing away his untouched bowl. I'm a little surprised at you, Leldoran. Your passion for correcting wrongs seems to have overlooked this place. Might I suggest your next crusade include a visit to the lord of this domain? His hanging seems long overdue. I hadn't realized it was so bad, Leldoran replied in a subdued voice. He looked around as if seeing certain things for the first time. A kind of sick horror began to show itself in his transparent face. Garion, his stomach churning, stood up. I think I'll go outside, he declared. Not too far, Aunt Paul warned. The air outside was at least somewhat cleaner, and Garion picked his way carefully toward the edge of the village, trying to avoid the worst of the mud. Please, my lord, a little girl with huge eyes begged. Have you a crust of bread to spare? Garion looked at her helplessly. I'm sorry, he fumbled through his clothes, looking for something to give her, but the child began to cry and turned away. In the stump-dotted field beyond the stinking streets, a ragged boy about Garion's own age was playing a, a wooden flute as he watched a few scrubby cows. The melody he played was heartbreakingly pure, drifting unnoticed among the hovels squatting in the slanting rays of the pale sun. The boy saw him, but didn't break off his playing. Their eyes met with a kind of grave recognition, but they didn't speak. At the edge of the forest beyond the field, a dark-robed and hooded man astride a black horse came out of the trees and sat watching the village. There was something ominous about the dark figure, and something vaguely familiar as well. It seemed somehow to Gary and that he should know who the rider was, but though his mind groped for a name, it tantalizingly eluded him. He looked at the figure at the edge of the woods for a long time, noticing without even being aware of it that though his horse and rider stood in the full light of the setting sun, there was no shadow behind them. Deep in his mind, something tried to shriek at him, but, all bemused, he merely watched. He would not say anything to Aunt Paul or the others about the figure at the edge of the woods because there was nothing to say. As soon as he turned his back, he would forget. The light began to fade, and because he'd begun to shiver, he turned to go back to the inn, with the aching song of the boy's flute soaring toward the sky above him. There ends Chapter 5 of The Queen of Sorcery by David Eddings. That's all we're going to do tonight. My voice is pretty much done for the day. But um, it was a pleasure to read to you guys again. It's been, uh, been too long. So hopefully we'll do more of these very soon. I'll have a, a good night and I'll catch you again soon. Cheers.